Melissa, it looks like she's a little fat. You can sit up at the table, Melissa. No, I like I like Okay, it's recording. Yeah, you yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, big, big dumb I'm feel so bad. I have to sit with my son here. I say probably an hour and 15 minutes. No more than one laser. No, I don't let the screens cross. Oh, you guys are sitting right there. Right? Close, close, close. Don't let the screens cross. Have you seen those questions? I have a long time ago. We're going to probably wait about five more minutes to let people making their way here actually get here. Did you, did you have somebody, some of you was here? Yeah, here. Did you, did you, you still have somebody coming? No, What's that? They don't love that. They're abandoned child. Yeah. Oh, you're abandoned. I see your mom, too. Okay. Because I'm his temporary mom. No. I'm sorry. Apparently, I can only be one person's mom. That's not how that works. You can't be your sister. But you have an answer. Wait, she can't be your sister. Probably not. <laughs> I guess it's an emergency light that can't be shut off. So. What's that? What are these emergency lights? lights so it can, I don't think it can be shut off. I don't think it's special. Yeah. 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 Want me to ask him? You can go ask him. Here, too. Can you try to put something over the top of it? Um. I guess we can. If we had some masking tape, we're going to roll it up and reach up. Yeah, and just put it up there. <laughs> right. Yeah, just take some duct tape. Yeah, Solve the problem. Strip the duct tape, yeah. <laughs> it's not controlled by some other weird switch like in the other room. That's probably the one behind the bookcase. No. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> <laughs> 
Over on that side, it's only the screen switches. What's the motion for that? Hey, Bob. Hi. Just we all don't want to follow the store. Does anybody want to stay still for that? We all don't want to Like 15 minutes, I think? Actually, that doesn't stop it. It's always on. Oh. Security chose that light. What's that? Apparently, security chose that light to be on. Turn it off. Only secure. How does security turn it off? It no, it, does, it doesn't well, even we... go off at night. It doesn't even go off at night. It's on. Yeah, I thought that was the one. That's right. Yeah, you, you think they wouldn't use the one right in front of the projector? Yeah, I know. I just, they, don't, they don't think about you. How about, how about one of these back here? Like, yeah. you know, which light should I get? You didn't even notice that I cut out about a third of the bread off, did you? Did you even notice that I got rid of about a third of the bread? I couldn't get past the secretary. Maybe you had it. Nobody put any stickers on the. You guys. I sliced the bread in three. And I got you guys didn't get any stickers. Nice stickers or NASA stickers on your on your bread. Remember I showed you guys. That's what I wanted to see. Oh man. I think everybody's just about here. Okay. Of course, the phone ring.
Everybody's family's here except John's, and they're on the way, and he goes second anyway. So. Hey, you don't think you care about this? <laughs> no, you can't stand right here. <laughs> oh, oh! <laughs> Want to get a, good, get a shot of my ribs? Yeah. Maybe <laughs> we're gonna stand there and just stand uh, a little bit. Yeah, you don't. <laughs> What was that? <laughs> you know it'd be on YouTube and go viral. <laughs> like in the 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit that out. <laughs> All right, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to our, this is our second uh, NASA winternship activity. Uh, it culminates with the students presenting uh, the work that they did over the last three weeks or so. Um, they've worked very hard at it in terms of uh, being here every day of the week. The, the, the one group came on Saturdays because one of our helpers from Cal State San Bernardino wasn't able to make it in the middle of the week, so they decided to come on Saturday. So it's made kind of a, gen, a very short January, in a sense, for some of us. It, it doesn't seem like it seemed like it was just uh, the second or third a couple days ago, and I'm sure these guys probably feel the same way. Uh, we have two presentations. Uh, we have a, the first group um, in, did an investigative analysis of air quality in the Coachella Valley since that's what the title of their topic, uh, their presentation is. The, um, the other group worked with Lego Mindstorm Robots, and they changed their title a half a dozen times, so I don't know what they'll have today. But, uh, but they um, really had a, a great time. Both groups have done a really great job. It's part of a bigger project in terms of trying to encourage students to apply for and get into summer internship positions. Two of the students who participated this winter are guaranteed an internship this coming up summer at Dryden um, Flight Research Center at, at Edwards Air Force Base. And uh, we're hoping some of the other ones will also get internships at, at other uh, laboratories and other universities around the US. So that's, that's our real goal. At this point, I would like to thank a couple people who participated uh, during uh, this activity. Uh, sitting in the back, we have Nick Westberg, from, um, in, who's our LabVIEW guru and LEGO Mindstorms uh, expert, I guess we can say. I don't know if he still feels like an expert after the last few weeks, but uh, uh, he's, uh, this is the second year for Nick. Uh, he's working two jobs as he also teaches. How many labs is it over at Cal State San Bernardino? I believe it's four. Seven labs, you said? Seven. He's doing seven labs. Uh, so uh, it, 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 it keeps him very busy. Uh, other person who uh, has been helping for the month of January is actually a former Mesa student. Uh, just about, he has to take a couple classes here and be finishing his degree in geology from UCLA. And he's also our cameraman today, apparently. It's Eric McLeod making sure that I'm uh, in the picture, apparently. 
And, uh, but uh, he, he worked with the atmospheric science group and, uh, and guided them on a daily basis. I was kind of in charge of the overall thing. I did work, obviously, quite a bit with the atmospheric group. Um, at this point, I would like to just go ahead and turn it over to the first group, and our, uh, their first speaker will be Jesse, and he will take care of the introductions, and we'll go from there. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse Espinosa, and as Dr. Frommer already said, our project is Investigative Analysis of Air Quality in the Coachella Valley. I'd like to introduce my team members, Juliana, oh, I'm sorry, Juliana Castillo, Osvaldo Hernandez, Ana Chavez, Reyes Escobar, and Alex Aldape. Okay, so does this look picture look familiar to anybody? Yeah, that's pretty much what it looks like here all the time, right? <laughs> okay, so why did we choose the Coachella Valley? Well, first of all, because we live here, right? Uh, second of all, we chose the Coachella Valley because we have a misconception here. Because we have good air quality and real clear days, good weather, we are, are under the misconception that we always have good air quality days here. When in fact, we don't always have good air quality days. We have bad air quality days too. So what was our objective? Our objective was to find out where does our air pollution come from? What are the constituents that make up the poor air quality? But how long does it take them to react with one another to the point where they're actually bad for us? And how do they get here? So having that information, we were able to backtrace some of these constituents and find out where they actually come from and how do they get here. So part of the discussion that we're going to have today is we're going to discuss air quality, the air quality index. What is the definition? What are some of the measurements that they take to determine what the air quality is? Ozone formation. Again, the chemical constituents that make up ozone. Good ozone, bad ozone, and more descriptions and some um, definitions. Particular matter. How does it form? What different kinds there are? Different sizes. And the high split model. The high split model program. How does it work? Who made it? And how we were able to use it to implement it into the study that we did. So um, when we started this, um, we agreed that the best place to start was at the beginning, right? <laughs> so in order to start, we needed to understand um, what it was that we're studying and what it was composed of. So we're doing atmospheric chemistry. So first of all, we needed to understand uh, what the parts of the atmosphere were. So first, <coughs> um, we have the troposphere which as you can see by red in this, uh, this picture, that tiny red dot right there, that's the atmosphere we're actually surrounded by. And this uh, puts it into scale, how really insignificant <laughs> we, uh, we are compared to our atmosphere. Um, this is where all the weather happens. This is where natural disasters form and take place. Um, this is known uh, as the region where the air turns over because there's vertical mixing in air, and that's how you get the different um, the different uh, weather that we experience on a daily basis. Um, the stratosphere, or the troposphere, excuse me, has different thickness depending on the region it's over. The closer you get to either the, the north or the south pole, the thinner the troposphere becomes. And the closer you are um, to the equator, the thicker it is. So it, it really depends on <clears throat> Excuse me. Where you're living in the in the in the planet, on what kind of effect it will have um, on your life. Next is the uh, stratosphere. As you can see, it's in yellow. So it's this little part that's right over us. Um, because of our study, it's only um, we're concentrating on our valley and what really affects us. So we are uh, concentrating only on the troposphere. But uh, the atmosphere actually has uh, five layers to it. And as, like I said uh, before, as you can see, what we actually live in is very, very insignificant compared to the complete atmosphere. 
next, uh, we needed to find out what it was that we were looking for. So, um, as Jesse said previously, we're looking at the pollutants that are in our area and uh, where they come from. But in order to identify the pollutants that we have here, we need to understand what it, what it is that make up, makes up pollutants. <laughs> so, um, we have aerosols. Uh, the word aerosols and uh, pollutants are intercha interchangeably used, but it's important to note that aerosols, well, all aerosols, um, what they are, are liquid and solid uh, particles that are suspended in different layers of the atmosphere. So um, all, all aerosols can be pollutants, but not all pollutants can be aerosols. And what I mean by that is, uh, like I said, aerosols um, are solid and liquid particles, but there's also gas that uh, forms pollutants, which we'll learn about later on in the presentation. So there's uh, two types of aerosol. We have primary aerosols, which are directly emitted into the air, and primary aerosols can be traced back to their original source. Um, the main source here of primary aerosols is actually dust, which uh, you'll learn more about later on in the presentation. Next we have secondary aerosols. These aerosols uh, form in our atmosphere, and they form by chemical reactions that involve those primary aerosols that are directly emitted into the atmosphere. Um, as you can see in this picture, it, uh, it shows these are the primary pollutants, and like I mentioned earlier, um, aerosols are known as solid and liquid uh, particles, as it's described here. So those are suspended particles that are in our atmosphere. But as it shows, there are gases that, um, that are emitted into, into the atmosphere as primary pollutants. Um, and as you can see, there are secondary pollutants up here. For our analysis, we're only going to concentrate on ozone, which is right there, and particulate matter, which uh, you'll learn more about. This other picture um, shows what the products of uh, what secondary pollutants actually look like when they uh, when they react or when they form in the atmosphere. It creates a haze, and um, as you can see, it's not very clear. Many of us confuse it with clouds, but it's actually a a nice haze that <laughs> that kind of interferes with our visibility most of the time. Okay, so. In order to track the pollutants that we have in our atmosphere, we needed to find a monitoring system that was able to uh, measure these pollutants and also relate them to how it affects us health-wise. So th that is that exactly what the AQ um, air quality index is. The air quality index is uh, set up was set up by the EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency, and they work together with local agencies to measure these pollutants and um, and uh, convert those those the measures of those pollutants into the values that you see here. The reason they convert them into the into the values here, as you can see, the the table goes from zero to five hundred, is so the general public can have a nice understanding of what these uh, what these pollutants are and how they can affect it. So the AQ the air quality index concentrates on measuring five different pollutants. We have uh, ground level ozone, particulate matter, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen dioxide. Um, this is the equation that they use. The, the way it works is that they have levels um, that they have that are called breaking points. And they, the way it works is that they have on a yearly basis Oh, this is a table that shows the breaking points. They, on a yearly basis, um, they um, take the level of pollutants that there are, and they modify the breaking points depending on the level uh, that is, re I guess, uh, required decent, depending on the level that you've seen <coughs> in this uh, in this table of values. Um, another thing too is that the EPA, um, <coughs> the EPA. Uh, has a national standard at 100. So if anything is under 100 on this, this table, then we're still considered uh, decent. Okay. This is the air quality index value for today here in, here in the Coachella Valley. As you can see up here, 
like I stated earlier, the, uh, the, Air, and the Environmental Protection Agency works with these agencies listed up here in order to monitor uh, the pollutants in our area. They have monitors all over the all, all over the nation. So, and with the help of these agencies, they uh, they keep track of the pollutants that we have in our area. So, with the equation that I just showed you, they um, they find the value for each uh, each of these pollutants. And the way they have they decide whether it's a good day or a bad day when it comes to um, the air quality index is that they get the highest, the worst case scenario for any of the pollutants, which you can see here. They have a for particulate matter, PM 2.5, they have a 45 today. So that's the value they're going to use to generalize, generalize for the rest of the day. You can also find this information on the daily news. I mean, now that I, I hope that now that I've shown you what it means, you can recognize it when you see it on your uh, weather forecast later tonight. <laughs> and now, Ozzy will explain what ozone is. All right, well, we're going to here to talk about ozone. Um, Ozone is formed in both the troposphere and the stratosphere. And it's, that's an important de designation because depending on where it's located in our atmosphere, it could have some rather severe effects on our local environments. Um, I'm sure you all hear talk about the depletion of the ozone layer. You know, when they talk about global warming on the news, big hot points. And when they're talking to that, they're, they're specifically referring to stratospheric ozone because that serves the purpose of actually blocking us from the sun's harmful ultraviolet radiation. Basically protects us from getting skin cancer. But the focus of our uh, research was on tropospheric or ground level ozone, also cleverly called bad ozone in, in uh, opposition to good ozone, just stratospheric ozone. Um, ozone forms from a series of photochemical reactions, and the precursors to the reactions are typically the oxides of nitrogen and sulfur, carbon monoxide, and volatile organic compounds. So, in order to form ozone, these compounds undergo a complex, process, uh, complex set of chemical reactions that are catalyzed by this process known as photolysis. Uh, photolysis is also known as photodisassociation, which I believe is a much more apt description of what it entails because it's basically the light, which is a particle. It can be expressed as a particle, and that particle has energy. And what that particle does is it reacts with compounds, molecular compounds, and breaks them apart overcomes the barrier between the electrons that are actually bonding those compounds together and breaks them apart into radicals. And it's generally under this form. The non-radical will, will react with the, uh, with the photon to give you, to give you two uh, radicals. Now, this is a light-dependent reaction, meaning that it peaks during the day, typically at around 2 o'clock, which is when sun intensity is the highest, and it'll um, drop down at night. So it's got a day and night cycle. And since we know this, we can make the prediction that there would be a correlation between average light hours and average ozone levels in our valley and anywhere really throughout the year. So here's a little bit more information on just how ozone is formed. We have this set of chemical equations, but we don't really need to go over this. We can balance out a lot of these, uh, a lot of these intermediate steps and leave you with this final step, which is a generalized form. All of these steps happening in between. So you get carbon monoxide uh, reacting to two oxygen molecules and, one, uh, and a photon to give you two carbon dioxides and an ozone. Um, of note, the VOCs, which I described in the last slide, uh, they play an important role in formation of ozone, but they typically occur before the set of reactions. They typically lead into it. It's really complex, and I didn't feel like giving you like 20 list chemical reactions, so I decided to look it up. And, uh, so yeah, this picture just describes the very beginning of this reaction. Uh, both of these uh, constituents, uh, the hydroxyl radical and carbon dioxide, are formed naturally in the atmosphere through, through the photolysis of water vapor and carbon dioxide, which are both naturally occurring. Uh, the rate of this reaction cycle is typically 24 to 48 hours, but uh, that's just a typical for like for like a single for like a single case reaction. The process is, is is ongoing; it doesn't really stop. It's just it just has cycles. So here's some ozone data that I've acquired. Uh, this graph shows for the year 2011, days and three-day increments versus sunshine hours. And as you would expect, it peaks during the summer at just over 12 hours. And corresponding to that, we have ozone levels for the year 2011 on the same three-day interval, uh, measured in parts per million. And as you can see, it peaks during the summer as well. Um, 
Just a note about parts of the moon, it might seem like an insignificant value at first, but when you couple the fact that these molecules are so tiny with the fact that our atmosphere is so huge, even one in a million ends up being pretty significant. Definitely significant enough to affect us and our environment. Uh, this red line here is uh, the California 8-hour average uh, standard for ozone levels. This is where we want to be. We want to be below this line because this is the level set up by the state of California. And there's also a national average, which is a bit, which is a bit higher, I believe, at a 0.12 parts per million, but it is not high enough to be in this graph, or too high to be in this graph. All right, so now this graph here uh, showcases yearly trends in ozone levels, and it shows a rather steady decrease, which is a good sign, uh, from the year 1975 to 2011. So it shows us that we are improving our relative ozone containment in the Chell Valley, but it's still not quite where we want to be. There's that 0 0.07 parts per million again, California average standard. <coughs> so while we are on the, on the road to improvement, we still have some work to do. So now I'll pass it over to Anna to talk to you about a particular matter. Thank you. The second part pollutant that we find in the atmosphere here in the Coachella Valley is particulate matter. And the California Environmental Protection Agency has classified those into two different groups. The particulate matter 2.5, which I'm going to call fine particle matter right now, and part particulate matter 10, which is coarse par particulate matter. As you can see here by the picture I have, this is actually a human hair, and this is fine beach sand. The, the coarse particulate matter is in blue, while the fine particulate matter is in red. And as you can see there, the, you have to have at least 10 parti uh, coarse particulate matters in order to go across one side of a human hair. And then again, the smaller particulate matter, there needs to be a, a very high number of those in order to create the same size of a, of a coarse particulate matter. Now these things are formed in a, two different ways. One of them can be biogenic, which are naturally occurring in the atmosphere. And those are such as brush fires is a main uh, cause of it here. Also dust storms, sea spray, and pollen. The second, the second source that we have here is anthropogenic, which means it's man-made and it's our fault. It's the reason why it's here. This comes from vehicle emissions, wood stoves. It comes from, uh, let's see, industrial processes and refineries, quarries, and especially fossil fuel power plants. Now these these are actually formed in a couple of different ways. There's condensation and coagulation. Before I start, I want to explain the main difference between these two. Both include water vapor in order to be formed. Condensation forms only with the gaseous particles, which are the fine particles, and coagulation forms only with solid particles, which are the coarse particles you can see. I'm gonna go ahead and start over here on the right side of the screen because that is for the coarse particles only, and it's simpler to, to uh, explain. Now, let's imagine that a dust storm happened, and the dust go ahead is traveled up into the air. The one or two things can happen from this point. It can either evaporate and form a cloud, or it can go ahead and just mix around in the atmosphere for a few hours and then come back down. That's that cycle which happens just about every day. The second the second one here is <coughs> the second one here is for the precursor gases. They are emitted from those anthropogenic sources I mentioned earlier. And in the nucleation process, these gases are just crazily running around in the atmosphere, jumping and crashing into each other. And they form ultrafine aerosol particles during this process. Once that happens, condensation or coagulation happens like I said, depending on what kind of particle it is. In the condensation process, these gaseous particles, these gaseous ultra-fine part aerosol particles actually, get stuck in with some water vapor that's naturally occurring in the atmosphere. These things start to kind of grow on top of each other like a snowball effect, and then they, they then evaporate <coughs> and can form into a cloud and then precipitate. For the coagulation process, the coarse particles, these ones right here, right there, they interact with the water vapor in the air 
and they eventually start sticking together to form a sort of chain or a link, kind of like a necklace. Once they get to a certain size, they just kind of crash into one another to become a bigger particle. And that's where the fine aerosol particles come in, and again, they can either evaporate or they can just come down. Now, coarse particulate matter, some examples that we find here are smoke, uh, dust, pollen, and dirt, especially the dust here since we live in the desert. It can last in the atmosphere for minutes up to hours and can travel up to 30 miles in a day. Now, I'm not really going to focus much more on this coarse particulate matter because it doesn't have as many health effects as the finer particulate matter does, but I do <coughs> want to say this, that coarse particulate matter, when it is inhaled, can have a mucus buildup and can aggravate pre-existing respiratory problems. So that is a problem for certain people here. Now, for the final particulate matter, 50% of our air here in the Coachella Valley that we breathe every single day is made up of ammonium nitrate, which is found in fertilizer. And that actually really surprised me. Oh, actually, it didn't surprise me at all. <laughs> One, because of all the green, uh, what is it, golf courses that we have around here and the agricultural land that we have at the east end of the valley. The other 50% is made up of secondary organic aerosols, elemental carbon, and primary organic carbon, which don't play as much of an effect. Now, these things can last in the air from weeks up to months and can travel hundreds of miles, which we will see later on in the slideshow. Now, these, they're so fine and small, they can only be seen with an electron microscope. And when you inhale them, they can be inhaled so deeply that they get lodged really deep in your lungs. And you, they can form cancer, chronic lung disease, and possibly even lead to death. And that is a very serious thing here. Well, for other ones. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I have here on the graph is 2011's particulate matter, which is measured in micrograms per cubic meter. The red dotted line there represents the California average at 12 micrograms per cubic meter. That should be our, our highest port, part, that should be our highest limit that we ever reach. And as you can see, there are a couple of, or a few different days when the particulate matter is above that standard, which we will see more of later. Here we have uh, about a decade's worth of trend for the particulate matter here in Coachella Valley, it was taken. The blue one represents the California standard again, and I just want to point out that even though there are a few dips and rises here, we are steadily decreasing in our particulate matter, which is very good for us. And now we're going to go ahead and check out some of those days that were high. Okay. <clears throat> what we have here is a high spit model, and it's a really um, neat tool that you know we're allowed to use that is really helpful and for for how for helping us find uh, wind trajectories of certain particles. Okay, what is a high spin model? It's a hybrid particle, Lagrangian integrated a trajectory model. Um, and it's a program developed by the, by the National Oceanic and the Atmospheric Administration, along with the Australia's Bureau of Meteorology. And what it is, it's a, uh, it's a complete system that computes uh, simple to complex trajectories of wind, um, dust, and uh, fire as well. So um, how it works. Um, it has a built-in option that lets the user download data either by monthly, bi-weekly, or daily. And uh, well, since we're focusing on uh, 2011, well, I just want to let you know why we're focusing on 2011. It's because we don't have enough data for 2012 because it just ended. So that's why we focus on 2011. So since we were focusing on um, high PM 2.5 days, um, I, we needed to download archived files of 2011. And once we had those, we were able to um, uh, run them through the system, um, enter our uh, latitude and longitude of Kajal Valley, and uh, it would show us uh, the wind path of, uh, of the air particles. So, well, before I could, um, go into it, the trajectory is basically a wind path that the particle takes to get to our area. And uh, the way it measures it, um, we're getting back, back trajectories of, for, of 24 hours, and how it, how it, how it, um, how do you say it? How it computes the data in 
it computes, computes the data every five minutes. So um, for every five minutes, it computes the data where it was at for the past 24 hours. Okay. So what we have here is one of the models, and we have this is the PM 2.5 uh, highs of 2011. You can see kind of trends goes up and down. But we, what we wanted to focus on are the high PM 2.5 days, and what I focus on are these three. And I want to start off with the low low one first. Um, since most of our air comes from the alley basin, um, we we thought you know most of our bad days <coughs> always come from the alley basin, but it turns out uh, not always. But for the for this high, it was actually coming from the alley basin, Los Angeles area, and this is of where we're at right here. And this is this these spots right here are 24 hours back. So it took 24 hours to get to our area, and when it was coming. The wind path when it was coming to, towards us, it was actually I'm getting all those um, particles, those bad air particles that the PM 2.5. And uh, the next uh, model that we have is next highest, the second highest. And uh, as we can see here, that we don't see the air trajectory coming from Los Angeles area. We're actually seeing it coming from the L, um, Las Vegas area. And these are these both are the same days, April the 15th. And we can see there here that. Instead of taking coming from the LA area, it came from the Las Vegas area, and well, that's the reason why we got um, had a, a high peak in that day because it uh, was actually coming from Los a Las Vegas area. And this next, the, the this anomaly here, as you can see, this is almost as double the, as the second highest of PM 2.5. Uh, we're wondering, you know, we, we found out the trajectories of uh, of this day, and it wasn't coming from either Las Vegas or the Los Angeles Los Angeles area. It was actually, we, we, we did some research, we found out that this is August 28th. Uh, two days prior, there was a big fire in Baja, California, here. And uh, we noticed that the trajectories that was giving us was coming from the south. And so, um, throughout these days, they were coming from the north. This is the uh, Salt and Sea right here, we're about right here. It was coming north, and it kind of slid back down, and during that reading, this is what actually come. Um, <laughs> how build up this high peak in uh, PM 2.5 data, and the, what I want to say is that a lot of people um, believe that we get bad air quality because of the Los Angeles area, but um, there there are other places that actually contribute to our high PM 2.5 days, and uh, that's what you know. I just wanted to let you guys know. So <laughs> next will be uh, Anna. Or, um, Alex. Alex. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so in conclusion, the occurrence of high concentration of particulate matter that has been received in the Coachella Valley for the year 2011 is not completely associated from the Los Angeles Air Basin. Now in conclusion, for the concentrations for the PM10 and PM2.5, we can see um, yes or no, um, over a decade that it is gradually declining and it's also under um, the national standard. <coughs> As well for the um, PM 2.5, it is actually more of a, a slowly consistent decrease. Also, just to reiterate um, what has um, been said previous about the primary and secondary aerosols that primary are directly uh, emitted into the atmosphere, secondary mixed with the primary also into the atmosphere. In conclusion, also. Um, the ozone uh, is also produced when volatile organic compounds, VOCs mentioned, also with um, nitrogen oxides, um, also undergo with the process of uh, volatilisis. And as you can see, um, the ozone air quality throughout the decade also as well, oops, sorry, um, is also um, slowly decreasing, um, but we're still just a little bit over. Also, um, the measurement of how we are keeping track of the concentrations of particulate matter, as was mentioned, is the um, air quality index, and also that is um, color-coded also in accordance with the number based on that formula that was shown earlier. And as you can see, um, uh, following with that website, you can specifically see um, the, the most heavily concentrated compared to the least concentrated area. Okay, we just want to have uh, um, some great thanks to people who helped us uh, throughout um, this our entire internship. Um, Dr. Carl Farmer, um, internship director and coordinator. Uh, Eric McLeod, thank you.
for um, giving us direction and answering all of our questions. Uh, who's uh, our assistant coordinator? Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Aku Asa. <coughs> Uh, uh, Wuku. Uh, okay. <laughs> I always have problems with that. Um, associate, pro um, associate professor uh, at the University of Riverside. Um, also, David Cocker, who was wonderful in showing us the facility over at CSERT. Um, he's Center of Environmental Research and Technology. It was really great to, to um, hang out with him for a day. Also, um, uh, MESA, um, which is Mass Science Engineering and Achievement. Uh, NASA Dryden Site Center. We also got a, a trip and uh, looked at all their facilities and just really exposed us to all the opportunities and um, all the um, research that is just amazing that we could um, participate in later. Uh, and last but not least, CPAIR, which is Curriculum Improvements Partnership Award of the Integration of Research, which is lovely. And, um, <laughs> Um, in collaboration with uh, Cal State San Bernardino, Tim Usher, P.I., and Alec Sim, who also at uh, Dryden Research Center um, showed us their internship, their project that they were working on, which was really amazing. So it was really nice for you. And that concludes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we don't want to see where you got all So this concludes our presentation. Um, we're going to open this up for questions. And, oh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. Yes. In your research, did you stumble upon why uh, we don't hear anything about airline pollution? Um, actually, when it comes to the airline pollution, that's a part of everything that we're talking about because it's all the elements and all the particulates, and all the, the, the pollution is mixed in all of that. But uh, specifically, as the increase of how much that is contributing to our um, situation, to our, the concentration that we're receiving, there's, there's, um, there is documentation on that, but it's just a part of everything that, we are, we're, that we're seeing. What's the impact? What's the degree of impact on the impact. pollution from the airlines? Because you never hear we didn't, we didn't focus on that. You didn't? Uh, uh, specifically of, of just from the airlines, but it was more the concentration of where these pollutants are coming from. That would just be added to the emissions from vehicles. Because yeah. it's a gas burning uh, source. Uh, source. It would be added? Yeah, that was, yeah. It, that would just be constituted as like uh, vehicle vehicle emissions, uh, plane emissions, mm -hmm. so they don't, they don't get identified though. Well, we, we didn't specifically jump into that, but in overall, when we took the measurements, and the EPA takes measurements, uh, they take measurements as a whole, they don't, uh, they have certain laws that specifically point at certain industries and regulate them, but as far as our study, we focus on the overall impact and the overall amounts. So, the automobile has been squeezed, but not the airlines. Um, I am assuming that uh, the airlines have also been squeezed, and as as the EPA puts out more stringent um, laws to prevent certain emissions from coming out, <coughs> technology has also taken over some of these things where we are reducing. As you saw by some of the graphs and some of the tables that we show, uh, we that we have a steady decline in some of these particular matters and some of these uh, bad emissions that are being put out. So. In, in a general trend, we are moving in a better direction, yes. In one of your diagrams, uh, you show the, uh, the sources of pollution being uh, the coast and inland. Is what, the coast is chemical and the inland is uh, dust, is that, is that fair? Uh, no, no what, what, what we were showing were, we're showing back trajectories on those specific high days that we had. What we were showing was on those particular days, where did that air carry those pollutants from? So, for example, when he showed his last slide with the fire, we were able, it kind of worked backwards for us. We, we found a really high day, and we couldn't find a reason as to why, why was it so high. So then, uh, I think it was Ozzy that found it. He went back into, um, just into Googling some information, and he was able to find, uh, first of all, they found the back trajectory. Okay, well, what's going on down in Mexico? Right, and then he got into the finding more information. He was able to find that there was actually a fire. So that's why you have the lines of different days. Okay, in that particular case, 
It comes from the south because of the, of the fire. Did that put the The pollutants from LA and Las Vegas are the same? Uh, not necessarily. I would that's, that's what, that's what yeah, I'm trying to understand. They would be d composed of different materials cut because I would assume, I'm just assumption here, that most of the particulates coming from Las Vegas were dust and dirt because there are no real refineries or factories that in was, Las Vegas. That's what I was getting but at. in LA there are. And that also to add into it, there is sea spray coming from the ocean that helps add in with the chemicals coming from the refineries in LA. And so they are two different, in my assumption. And um, may I add to that, that with, as uh, we started out with this, we were trying to see how much of our pollutants really came from the LA basin. And once we got into it, we realized that we have so many sources coming here to the valley. And in addition to what we're producing and passing on, that it really would take a, it would be like a, a, a new internship <laughs> in order to be specific on what balloons exactly are, are affecting us. You mentioned fertilizer being uh, uh, one of the yes. biggest con contributors. Yes. And, and one of your um, um, uh, slides, I don't know if you can go back to it, uh, the um, uh, back to check the, the the farming area. Uh, I think I show it. North of Los Angeles. Yes. Yeah. It showed a uh, high concentration. Mm -hmm. um, is that because oh, definitely. the fertilizer uh, or yes. the, the topography? Mm -hmm. Yes. It definitely accounts for it, especially with the uh, ammonium nitrate, mm -hmm. because we have a lot of dairy up there. Mm -hmm. so that's that's one of the leading causes of our valleys up here in the valley. So we eat that. I have a question. Pretty much, it's everything. You had a question, sir? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I'm, I'm looking at your references here and mm -hmm. trying to figure out the original source of the data. Is it the AQMD for the particulate in the ozone? Yes. So it's, it all, it's all covered by the AQMD in this area? Yes. Okay. That's where I got the authority <coughs> from my dad. And do you have to go to secondary sources or can you go to them directly? It would just take a, it, what it took is it took going to them, but they have a lot of like sub pages, so it just takes a lot of weeding out. Sometimes when you think you have a solid direction and you have a solid page that you're gonna go to, you click on it and then you realize like, oh wow, this just took me like gave me 18 more turns that I need to get to to get what I was looking for. So it, it takes a lot of weeding out, but most of the information that we got, well, I mean all the information that we got for this presentation, we got from these sources. It just takes a lot of weeding out. Can we go again? Yeah, so the AQMD, the D is for district. How many districts are there? Is there... Oh, that's... Oh. <coughs> uh, we... There... There was a list of... Yeah, there was a list. When you go back to the, uh, for the AQI readings, that's for the entire state of California. So yeah. that, that big old list of so hard to read. These, those are all of the districts these for the state of California. Right here? All together. Yeah. yeah, those are all different districts. And they all work together with the Environmental Protection Agency in order to be able to gather this information on an, um, and for different regions. But so there's one for just Southern California. Right? Yes. yes. But that's one Southern California district. No, yeah. it's not split that's, up together. That's one agency. Um, that's uh, oh, responsible yeah. for, for our area. Yeah, but, but it's not, not just split into Southern. It's not just split into Southern California. It's a section of. It's of a sec Yeah, there's also yeah. subsections of Southern California. Southern Hopes. But yeah. not one specific for Coachella Valley. No, not for Coachella. No. no. We're kind of designated as a our own little area, but <laughs> kind we don't of have this because I've been studying the Sentinel plant. I don't know. <laughs> uh, we we read some information about it. Dr. Farmer found some information about it. Uh, but in whole, they, they put out uh, with like an 800 page, uh, <laughs> and you know, kind of when you go to court to keep your contract and it's all garbage in it, you're like, what is this? Yeah. yeah, so there was some information on there, but not a whole lot, well, actually, not, not much so that we can use for our study, for our presentation. So, what I'm interested in is that plant emits uh, ammonium nitrate, sulfur dioxide, and that gets mixed with the carbon monoxide from the I 10. and that's all going to be generated right here in the valley. Yeah. I'm wondering yeah. what kind of effect that's going to have on PM. Well, one of the things that I personally looked up is I wanted to well, get I'm an idea. Yeah. Um, hold on, Alex. One of the things that, that, that <laughs> I personally read up on was I wanted to uh, compare that plant compared to a coal burning plant, just for my benefit. So I, I was able to find that.
carbon dioxide, the, the amount that a plant like this produces compared to the other plants, it produces only about 20%. And the nitrogen system you mentioned, it also is at about 20% of the other ones. And it only produces less than 1% of the particulate matter that a uh, coal plant, that yeah. coal burning so power plant would burn. Yeah, 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 exactly. You're right. Yeah. We also have to take into consideration these wind patterns. Because what we produce here isn't always what affects us here. Because the wind is constantly moving and shifting around these pollutants, we're, we're not always uh, bringing in what pollu the pollutants we produce. That was one of the reasons we looked at the outside sources like the LA Basin, and as we, as we saw, we found some uh, pollutants coming from Mexico, some others from Las Vegas. So it's a, it really is like a national... Uh, so who do we pollute? Um, I actually read um, that portion of the list of all the um, PMs and construction concerns and everything like that, and they said that the um, that the emission amount would be less. However, it says that it would be in addition to the emissions already out, uh, that are already occurring, and that would bring it, or that would be under that would be under review because it would actually possibly. Be, be, they always say possibly can um, bring that over the line. Okay, um, we have one last question. Yeah, um, you told uh, um, you mentioned that these uh, these these fine particles have a uh, very long life in the atmosphere. Yes. And you found that one discrete event actually caused a spike in, in it. Now we know that the wind patterns are always changing and stuff, but since you traced it only one out day into the past. Could there have been a discrete event, possibly like wildfires in Arizona, that contributed to not 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 necessarily in Las Vegas, but maybe somewhere else, <coughs> a discrete event that could could have caused that spike? I mean, it, it could have. Uh, we didn't go too 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 many days into it. We only went um, <coughs> for like for like for that incident with the fire that happened on the 25th, I believe. Um, for those consecutive days, we noticed that the wind pattern was just kept going north and north and north. And uh, on the 28th is when they read the, got the reading, and that's when the, all the smoke and you know the particles were in our area. But that that's a very good uh, good question because we didn't for the high peak, uh, peak in like Las Vegas trajectory. Because we get air from Las Vegas all the time. Yeah, we, we do, but so we didn't really um, go so, so many days to see if there was actually a fire there because. Um, we didn't find any fires in during that time, so we assumed it was uh, from coming from the Las Vegas area. What's that little red spot on one of the slides north of uh, Vegas? It's a very high concentration, but it's very small. Uh, I think that's Salt. I think it's Salt Lake City, Utah. Salt. I'm pretty yeah, sure that's. Yeah, that conclusion slide. Yeah, that conclusion slide. I, I find it interesting. Place, yeah, that place is very, very. Um, I was reading an article just the, just the other day on it. Very good. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, it's Salt Lake? I'm pretty sure that's Salt Lake City. Yeah, that's Salt Lake City. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have another team that needs to come up and do their presentation, so we'd like to wrap it up and thank you for, thank you for uh, your question. Okay, our next group will take a Maybe a minute or two to get ready. I think if, I think their uh, presentation is already in the laptop. It's for them to get up here. If anybody wants to grab a quick drink or a quick snack? Uh, we'll still welcome to start in just a couple of minutes. Um, and we have time afterward, hopefully, for uh, some additional questions if you would like. Do you want to
some of our own robotic setups and from Lego uh, and so they're, they're, they had more to work with. They weren't quite as confined. They did quite a bit of designing as you will find out. And, uh, and I think they had a, a pretty good time. So, And at the end we'll have a, a demonstration in the maze. So at that point you can come up you know, and, and see how some of them actually operated. So at this point I'll turn it over to Edgar Lopez and he'll introduce his group and I go from there. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Edgar Lopez. Um, I just want to introduce the team. This is uh, Mark Schaefer, Todor Nicolo, <laughs> Michael Schultz, we've got Joe Moeller, John Roshan, and Arturo Palomino, and uh, Genaro Gonzalez. Let's get so uh, the main objective of this uh, internship was uh, for us to learn the uh, LabVIEW programming interface and also the uh, NXT Mindstorms interface. And uh, using those uh, tools, we could uh, build, uh, build the robots and program them so they can uh, navigate through complex environments. Um, in this case, our complex environment was the uh, maze right here. And uh, this was a really good challenge for us because it allowed us to test the decision making of the robots. Um, it also gave us a really good test for the sensors so we could uh, get the data coming in and actually interpret it as something and give that to the back, to the robot so they can interpret it and, and you know make the decisions while navigating the robot. And uh, I'll hand it over to Mark for the equipment. What you see on the screen here is that our, uh, the brain of the robot, it's the, the CPU, the, the processor of the robot. It's what we can program to give it instructions to, to navigate through the maze. Um, it's the equipment we have to work with. Uh, you've got the, the USB port, you've got some motor ports up here, uh, the input buttons to so navigate to the screen, some of the functions, and uh, connect up, up to four sensor ports on the uh, bottom. Uh, some of the sensors we have here are is the one of the first one here is the ultrasonic sensor. It kind of works like a bat. Um, the two eyes here, one's a, a sending um, sending wave, sending ult ultrasonic waves out uh, based on the distance it takes to uh, run into an object or so, uh, based on the time it takes to run to an object or so, and, and uh, 
come back to the receiving eye here, that's how far we can uh, extrapolate and return the distance. Um, some of the limitations of this, uh, one of the main limitations is when it gets up to around 255 centimeters, it doesn't really work that well. Um, something we have to work around in some of the equipment. Uh, the next sensor we have here is the uh, light sensor. It, it ranges different uh, light intensity values of the room. Um, with the ambient light of the room, um, it's around 20 or 30 or so, uh, based on the amount of lights. Um, you got two sensors here. This is the light, just the strictly the light one, and this is the color sensor. This color sensor can also return values uh, uh, based on the color, so <coughs> giving us different numeric values to, to work with in the language. Uh, this third sensor here is the, the the touch sensor. It's a, a Boolean touch sensor at yes or no value. Uh, it's kind of our, 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 our fail-safe. We use it a lot of fail-safe as our, uh, our robot, but the other sensors weren't working that well. This one kind of always did work. Uh, lastly, uh, we got uh, the motors. Um, we're, we're, uh, they have the sensors inside them. You can uh, base them on degrees of rotation, and so we can use that in some of our measurements to help the steering process and such. Um, <laughs> what you see here is 13 power input. This is kind of about the minimum amount of power to overcome the friction of the carpet and, and get our get our object moving. Um, it's got a total. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, so after we're done with the hardware, I want to talk a little bit about the software that we have to use. Uh, LabVIEW, it's made by National Instruments and it's a visual programming language. Unlike the more traditional ones where you type in the code of the program, this looks more like a flowchart, which we'll show you in a minute. Uh, we use the term VI, which stands for Virtual, uh, virtual Instrument. It's uh, basically a collection of code that's designed to do a specific task. Uh, the NXT robots, uh, they have a main program, the main VI, and inside of it we usually uh, ask s uh, small programs called sub-VIs to do a specific task like calculate the distance between two points and then give us some sort of value. They act like function calls in a normal language. Uh, motor and sensor controller is uh, not uh, given by default from uh, the LabVIEW software, so we have to use a special library provided by like Mindstorms so they can uh, be programmed. And here's a sample program that uh, I've made just for this presentation. Uh, basically, uh, the flow of the program <coughs> is from left to right, and this gray box right here means that everything inside of it will be repeated unless uh, this condition is satisfied. That's the stop button of the loop. Uh, initially, we check if uh, a button attached to port number one is pressed. If that is satisfied, if it's true, then it will send power of 50 to ports A and C, uh, making the robot go in presumably the forward direction. Uh, then checks again if the, port, if the button on port two is pressed, it will actually give negative power, which causes them to go in reverse. Uh, after that, it will do a small pause of uh, 100 milliseconds, and check if the orange button on the brick itself is being pressed. And that usually won't be the case, so we'll go to the beginning of the program again. Check the button, check the second button, and check for the enter button. And finally, when you click the orange button in the middle, that will cause it to exit this loop and stop the program. And we'll stop the motors, and that will be the end of the program. There is no actually any way that you have to show that this is the end of the program. So just is where it ends, that's that. Uh, essentially, this program, what it would do is uh, the robot starts at uh, rest, and when you press one of the buttons, it starts going forward. You press the other button, it starts going backward, and that continues to infinity until you stop it with the orange button. And now let's go. All right. Um, so an algorithm is just basically uh, a set of steps, or you know, like uh, certain. You're kind of telling the bot what to do in order to achieve a certain goal, and. Uh, we use uh, various uh, algorithms to uh, get the bots to certain things that we wanted. For example, one of our goals was uh, get the bot to follow light. So right here when you're looking in the, on the screen, there's a, a differential for uh, a light sensing program. And so what it does is, uh, assuming the bot has uh, two light sensors, one on the left and one on the right, then what we can do is we can take the difference between the readings and multiply it by some scalar 
and uh, we can feed that to like let's say uh, the steering, so we can get to uh, to get the bot to either follow the light or go away from the left. So that was one of the that was one of the algorithms we used for uh, for this program. Mm -hmm. And then for the ultrasonic sensor, well, the, this one you can do various things. Uh, basically, it, it reads the distance that is away from a certain object, and then you can get it to do uh, uh, various things depending on. Uh, uh, what you're trying to do, like for for example, if you want to navigate to maze without hitting the wall, then you can just say, okay, uh, when you're x distance from the wall, I want you to stop, or you know something like that. And uh, and uh, using case structures, kind of like what uh, Toto showed, you can make it so the bot can do different uh, things depending on how far it is from that object. So uh, you can have it so like if it's 50 centimeters from the wall, I want you to slow down until you're 20 centimeters from the wall. Once you're 20 centimeters from the wall, I want you to stop and maybe uh, do something else. And then uh, as far as the touch sensor, uh, well, this one is pretty much, uh, you know, like uh, keep doing what you're doing until you feel something, you touch something, and then once you touch something, move on to a different part of the program. And then uh, Joe, we'll continue with the next part. Um, so the state machine is, uh, a machine that's supposed to uh, have multiple states that it can go into based on different types of input that it takes. A uh, classic example is uh, a vending machine. Uh, based on what uh, buttons you push, it'll change into a different state of releasing some kind of snack or drink or whatever. Um, so we had to use the idea of a state machine to program these uh, robots to change between the two states of either uh, trying to navigate the maze based on you know whatever type of algorithm, algorithm we're using for that, or else to, to switch to following another robot that might have a light source attached to the, to the back of it. So um, we, we had to make the robots be able to detect a light source and then switch into a, a light following mode if, if it found a light source was in front of it. And so, uh, Edgar and Mark will talk about the, their robot. This is our, our, our robot design, just the robot. Uh, <laughs> it's, got, uh, it's got some of the design implementations are forward uh, facing ultrasonic sensor, <clears throat> kind of like the eyes of a human or so to kind of look forward and see if you run into a wall. Um, it's got these two uh, light sensors here, um, sort of offset to work really well with differentials. Close to the wall, I've got a problem. And then um, some, some of our code. Um, and, and, and this shows that uh, we, we have to do certain things based on certain conditions uh, follow the light or uh, move around, move out of the maze. And this, re this rents itself really well to a, a state machine type of program. And uh, Edgar will tell you about that. Okay. So, in order for us to go from the uh, following state or the navigating state, which is either following the light or uh, navigating on your own using the ultrasonic sensor. We implemented this, uh, this state machine right here, which you can see graphically right here. Um, and so what the process, it begins with the initial state, which usually it's meant to prepare the machine for whatever process it is. In this case, it's being uh, used just to transition to the uh, scan for light state. And in the scan for light state, we're actually using the, uh, the differential that they talked about uh, to look for that light. And so, uh, from here, what could happen is it could uh, find the light, which is the transition phase right here, and if it does, it'll go to the follow light state, uh, which will take the, the outputs from the differential to be able to steer the light towards, steer the wheels towards the light. Um, from there, if it loses the light, it goes back to the scan for light state. Now, if it doesn't find any light, it'll go into the navigation state, which is just basically, uh, for our robot, it's just to go straight. Um, one of the problems that we saw in our robot was when it was going straight, it would kind of like curve because one of the wheels was spinning faster than the other. So we actually implemented a uh, auto-correcting steering algorithm, which I'll go over uh, after this slide. But in this, uh, for right now, it's it'll be going in the go straight uh, phase. And one of two things can happen here: it can either find the wall through the ultrasonic sensor, or it can uh, find the wall through, uh, to the touch sensor. So if it if it finds a wall with the ultrasonic sensor, it'll um, it'll trigger the turn state, which is. Um, for our case, we made the robot turn 90 degrees to the left first, scan for the wall with the ultrasonic sensor. If it sees a wall, it'll turn around 180 
which is basically going to the right and go that way. Um, otherwise, if it didn't find the wall in the first initial left turn, it'll just go straight. Um, and the back up state is, uh, what it'll do is, if, it, if it's uh, bumped, that means it's really close to the wall, so it should back up first, and then it goes to the turn um, state right here. And then, after all that, it goes back to the scanning for light um, state, in case there is any light source around. So here's the autocorrecting serial algorithm that I talked about. Uh, so the main problem that we saw was one of the wheels was spinning faster than the other, and that caused it to turn one way more. So what we had to do first is we had to get the, uh, the angular velocity of both wheels, uh, which you can with, uh, with the lobby because it has the built-in uh, sensor, so you can get the revolutions per time. And so we had to calculate that. And we got the actual linear velocity of both the wheels using this formula of radius times the angular velocity. Once we had that, we could uh, find the, uh, the average velocity of it, which we call the target, which is basically means we want both those wheels to be spinning at that velocity, so they both spin you know, at the exact same time, so they go straight. Um, in order to achieve that, though, uh, in LabVIEW, initially when you, when you call the, the function to actually make it go straight, you put in some power input. And uh, it turns out that even if you have the same power input on both of the motors, one might, go, uh, might one spin more than the other because of the condition of it. So what we had to do is we had to uh, somehow compensate for that and uh, add additional power or subtract it, uh, whatever was needed, so it could so they could match the speeds. Um, in this case, we call it a power difference, which is uh, what we need to add or subtract to the original power that we had, so so we can get the the target of velocity. <coughs> and uh, this formula right here is uh, is what actually gets us that difference that we need to add or subtract. And finally, once we once we got that. Uh, we add it to the original so they both uh, match the velocities pretty well. And this is actually calculating all the time in the, in the robot. So it's actually always doing these calculations to uh, compensate for it. So I, like say I, I picked it up and I slowed down one wheel, the other wheel should slow down with it too. Okay, here's our Kudo's uh, robot son. This is my robot and um, I went around the problem of it going in not straight by not putting it back. I just put a rudder so that it will provide friction. And if it went too much to the right, it will, it will make itself go to the, to the left because the friction will be over. Um, my robot, as you will see, has two light, one, one uh, distance, and one touch on the front. I'll show you again, actually. There's the touch right there. And once any, anywhere in that area is bumped, it, it triggers the touch sensor. So, again. Not back wheel, because I thought that would be better. It just basically just cracks along before. Um, now I want to show you how this robot, how the program that I made, solved the maze. It is basically just a um, two-state machine. Um, this part of the program says read the left side and see how far away you are from the wall. Take 20 away from that, multiply that by 4, and make sure that that value doesn't go above or below 100 or negative 100. And make that the steering of the wall. What that accomplishes is, is if it's too close to the wall, it'll steer to the right. And if it's too far away from it, it'll steer to the left. And then that happens over and over again until the bumper touches something. What it touches something, it goes to the next thing. Well, here, it got close enough, so it's going to go from the steering to the left to steer to the right, and then this motor that is being have more power is going to change to having more power on this side because the ultrasound got touched. Then it will steer to the left, and at the same time go kind of forward. It will touch the bumper, and it will activate this part. So it will tell go backwards for for a little time, and then turn right, and then it will start over again. It will do that over and over again, and what it accomplishes is that the robot tries to stay close to the left wall at all times. And then it repeats over and over again. And because it stays next to the left wall, it is guaranteed to touch every part of the maze. And if there is an exit, it will find the exit. And if it needs to find a spot, it will get to that spot because it touches all the whole maze. Um, I thought that that was the most simple and efficient, well not efficient actually, but I guarantee solution. <laughs> so, that was my part. Okay, and uh, while I was designing my robot, uh, I had this uh, 
idea that I should make my robot as small as possible and with the least amount of parts possible. So I went through a couple of different designs through that process. Uh, I've actually given them names. Uh, this one is a hundred and thirty. <laughs> it's a Spartan robot. <laughs> uh, then I shaved off the ten pieces and then I removed nine more. Uh, now by comparison, the same software that I'm using to build these uh, computes, the other uh, robots to have at least 200 parts or more. So that's, that I consider kind of a win. Uh, first one is the other poly. It was very short uh, and on the back there is no third wheel, just like our tour I'm using uh, kind of skids. This doesn't show any cables. Um, and it only has the two light sensors and the distance sensor. There is no there is no force sensor, there's no bumper or touch, which I thought I can avoid. But it turns out that the ultrasonic sensor has very narrow field of vision, so if something's coming at well, let's say the shoulder, it, you're not gonna see it. Uh, you're just gonna ram right into it. Uh, the second one, uh, I actually decided to go with an uh, upstanding robot, so the turning circle uh, will be smaller when it tur turns almost on the spot. Uh, and I actually added a bumper, which you can see right here, and it's connected to the touch sensor, which I buried deep between the two motors, and I've removed some pieces, so I can show you here. Uh, one of the things is, uh, you may have noticed I've kept the design almost uh, the same, because I have the main brick with the motors, all of them together, to try and uh, make the body as condensed as possible. So if you touch the bumper, it activates this lever and it touches the touch sensor right here, detects it's here into something. Uh, finally, I went the third way, uh, went one step further, because these uh, legs on the back, they were straight, the robot would be very unstable, so I went with a design that will be slightly leaning backwards. Uh, now it has a bumper, and as I said, the least amount of parts possible. Uh, the sensor moved to the top, including the distance sensor. It's no longer facing sideways. And um, so yeah, that's my final product. Now, during the designing of these and the writing the software, I had some problems. Uh, the big <coughs> challenge was the distance sensor would have... Oh, wait. <coughs> Let me show how it works. Uh, it's running through the maze and it will stop within a certain distance of wall. Then it will turn, make a 90 degree turn. After that, it will activate the sonar and do 180 degrees of scanning in front of it. Then it computes the data, decides which way will be the best to go, and then just go off in that direction. Now, this is a little uh, ideal situation that's <laughs> happening right here. Uh, my biggest problem was the sonar. Because, uh, as I've shown this diagram, if you face it straight at the wall, let's say it gives you 100 centimeters, but because uh, the echo travels and bounces off between walls, it will actually report a longer distance in this way and they'll make the robot go into the wall. I had that problem. Um, so I had to write a program to actually get around this. Uh, first, it will acquire the data, that's the 180 degrees of sweeping. Uh, once in all, I'll have spikes of data that basically says uh, the distance too much, and these will be very bad values that I just wanted to eliminate, so I started off with an algorithm that will round the data. And as you can see, it uh, passes it once, and there's the second pass, which is even more. And if it has any spikes, they'll be gone, usually over here. But with the second pass, I'm absolutely certain. Now, uh, I ran into an interesting problem where it will, it will be sideways to a wall, and it'll think that's the longest distance. Bump, reverse, and they say, OK, I'll scan again. Scans again, and the middle again says that's the longest distance. And I just had to implement some sort of filter that will say, uh, any values that you have in the middle reduce their desirability because why did you stop in the first place? That's because something was <laughs> in front of you. So there is the third filter which you can't really see here very well. I call it the M filter because it makes the shape of an M. Uh, here's a simulated demo of how it works. If you have all the data have the exact same values and you run the M filter, it shaves off up to 50% the closer it is to the middle. Uh, hence the name. So after between here and here, it actually, the values should be a little bit shrunken if they're closer to the middle. After that, it says the maximum distance is 187 centimeters at position 21, and it reports the full array size because of, for debugging purposes. And after that, it just goes in that direction. 
during the state machine problem, we wanted to make it follow a flashlight, which uh, presented another problem. Uh, I, it was when there is too much light in the room, we wanted to follow a flashlight. But when there's too much light in the room, or if there's some light coming through the door, uh, it will actually blow up turn this way, and it was undesirable effect, as you can see. Uh, so. My idea was to modulate the flashlight in such a way that you uh, make it flashing. And when it's flashing and you know the frequency, if you detect the light source and you can say, is that the flashlight, is it the sun? Check for that specific frequency, recognize it, and then go in that direction. So that was uh, overcome. It actually works from a bigger distance because of that recognition. Um, the third one was, as uh, Mark mentioned, we have, we have four ports for sensors. And in the LabVIEW software, I found out that these three buttons during, while the program is running, you can program it to recognize the pressing of these three buttons. So Mark and I actually designed this double lever system. So when you push this lever inwards, like it is here, you actually press the button on top, the brick can register it and then make a decision of that, basically giving you three more touch sensor, which is pretty good. And I believe it's Mike. Or, no, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is uh, known as the Minotaur, uh, mainly because of the two horns it has on the top here. Um, but this wasn't the final bot that we had. We had prototypes like uh, in any other project that we do. And there were about, I think, two other prototypes before this one. Um, the first one was using, I think, two touch sensors and the ultrasonic sensor. I didn't really like it too much because then we couldn't put two, two light sensors on it. Uh, so then I went with a different design where I scrapped the touch sensors and I went for two heads better than one. Uh, I put two ultrasonic sensors pointing on either side, left and right, imagining and thinking to myself, well, it'll be easier going through a maze if it stays in the middle looking at both wall. And that also presented a problem because it couldn't see forward. Mm -hmm. So I put a touch sensor underneath again and I lost my two light sensors again. So I had to change one last time, and this is what we ended up with, with one uh, ultrasonic sensor to the side, one forward, and then the two light sensors to the front. And this design works really well because now it, it follows the wall, sees what's in front of it, and it's just a lot easier to, to program. And so to, to program it, I'm gonna leave it to these other two guys. <laughs> Okay, so there, it has two algorithms, the light follow and the wall navigation. I'll talk about the wall navigation. Um, what it does is it has the sensor on the right of it and the sensor in the front. And so uh, it's constantly taking in readings from the uh, right wall. And it wants to stay um, distance of, we, we had it at 20 and then we changed it to 15 centimeters. Um, and so what, it, what it'll do is it'll, if it's too close to the wall, then um, it changes the, the steering so that it'll actually steer away from the wall. And then it's constantly reading, so if it gets too far away, it'll, it'll steer back towards it, and it stabilizes pretty quickly. Um, and so then it stays a good distance away from the wall, but as it's going along the wall, if um, all of a sudden uh, it sees the, the value of the distance of the wall become very large, as in if uh, the wall is not there anymore, then it'll, it'll make a hard, a hard right turn because it'll assume that you know if I turn right then there will be more wall to fall. It's just a turn, and so that in that way it'll it'll keep to the right wall. Uh, but what happens if um, there's it, it didn't turn right it turned left? That means that there's a wall in front of it, and so if it that's when the the, the front sensor will um, will detect a, a, a small value. So that means it's too close to something in front of it. So then it'll, it'll automatically turn left because that, that's going to be the case. If it was a right turn, it would have already turned right. So it must be turning left. And uh, there's a video of it happening. So it, see, it keeps seeing the wall, and that's why it's turning. Uh, or no, it's missing that wall, so that's why it turned right. But then it got too close to that wall, so it turned left. And, there, yeah. and then here's the code. Uh, so like the beginning here, it's, it's taking the right, the right wall reading. And uh, then here we calculate some things, and uh, this is a, a bunch of if-then statements that uh, determine, you know, how how far, how how it's going to steer to make sure that it stays the correct distance from the wall. 
And then uh, this <coughs> is taking the forward uh, sensor reading. And then um, that a little calculation here, and then another if-then statement that determines if it needs to keep going straight or to turn left. And uh, this this will loop over and over again. Um, so it's constantly doing these these two checks, and uh, and this solves the maze. And it also solves it the fastest of uh, any of the robots we have. So and here's John. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we, well, like I mentioned before, we not only have to uh, make and navigate the maze, but we also have to make it fall alive. So um, one of the ways that we found out uh, it was, you know, we can make it fall alive is uh, we made it as here. We had two light sensors, as I mentioned before, and we had one on the left and one on the right. And what we did is, uh, this is actually uh, not the code that we ended up using. This is just like... Uh, the ba what we based our code uh, with. But what we did is uh, we tested the room for ambient light and we concluded it was around 35, 45. So we basically said, okay, you know, uh, we're gonna use 35 and uh, we're gonna make, uh, we're gonna feed that to an end statement. So uh, whenever they're both true, in other words, when the bots see a significant light, then we want you to follow that light using the differential. And then when you're not, we want you to just spin in place searching for the light. Uh, and uh, here's a little video of it, but uh, the video is actually going to show the, the final product. It's, it's actually going to be uh, navigating, and then when it sees light, it'll just follow it. So there's Joe uh, putting a light in front of it, and it's, it's following it. And then if you ever see it like kind of start swerving right, it's when, uh, when it loses the light. And, uh, for uh, debugging purposes, uh, on the final code, we actually ended up adding uh, uh, sound to it. So every time it switches to it, it uh, makes sound. And then uh, here's a state machine. In other words, uh, we wanted the bot to uh, be able to navigate through the maze, and then when it sees a light, follow it all in once. So that uh, whenever the light goes away, it starts following the maze, and then uh, vice versa. So what? We came out, instead of using some random value to, uh, to determine whether or not light was significant or not, we decided uh, outside of the, the loop that the first thing the bot should do is uh, this light sensor uh, average. And then if you see these boxes, our code isn't that big because we used a whole bunch of sub -BS. In other words, uh, we made like one, giant, uh, one code and then we made, it, we made it a function and just plugged it in like that. So it would be nice and neat. So what this uh, light sensor average uh, does is it makes the bot spin and take about tw 20 values, and it makes an average of those values. And then <coughs> we tried uh, incorporating a standard deviation, and we wanted it to be two deviations from it. But as we found out, that uh, the difference between the values were so small that the standard deviation was giving us like one or two. It was between one and two. So uh, we ended up not using that, we ended up just adding some value to make the value significant. So as you can see, it's adding 15 to it. And then uh, we basically use that value to compare as to whether or not it should be uh, following uh, the maze or should be following the light. And that's why I have two pictures. One of them is uh, when it's false, <coughs> when it should be following the maze, and then uh, when it's true, that it is significant light, and it should be following the light. And then uh, this, we have a video of it. So, in the beginning, it's spinning, uh, making an average. And then it didn't see anything significant, so it's just going to navigate the maze. And then and just shortly, it will, uh, it, will, uh, it will see a light and start following the light. And then here, uh, Joe puts it, so takes it out of place. <laughs> Then he removes it and it just goes back to the <coughs> place. And uh, that, that's it for ours. Uh, Michael? All right, so I designed my robot with two goals in mind. I want it to be reliable and I want it to keep my life simple. Uh, and so I built this after about two weeks of programming with one of Nick's bots, one of the original mm -hmm. bots that we had. So I wanted to avoid some of the shortcomings and frustrations I encountered with that. First off was that fact that every time you have to replace the batteries in the robot, you have to rip out the whole um, the brain. Uh, yeah, you have to rip it out. 
and basically take your whole robot apart, or half of it anyways. And so I have, I designed it as kind of like a server rack, so you can slip it out by removing one pin easily. And um, it's also handy when I freeze it up with my bad code and I have to reset the thing. Uh, another one, another thing was that on the, um, the previous spot, the distance sensor was fixed to the robot. So when I wanted to make it scan 360, I had to have the robot actually spin in a circle. And, but it can't reliably do that. Whenever it spins around, it never exactly returns to the same place. And so I have a distance sensor that rotates 360 with its own motor. And because the motors can keep track of their position, they can, um, they can return to the same position. Or basically, it eliminates the accumulated errors. So even if it goes off by a little bit, it doesn't matter, because they can come back and it, it reliably returns to the same position. Um, another one was that the wheels tend to bend out. And when they bend out, the motor has to turn more to make the robot move the equivalent distance. And um, so by pro providing more support, we can help to eliminate that, or at least decrease its significance. Uh, so the way that the robot's designed to navigate the maze is to basically choose the shortest or the longest distance to turn in, turn in that distance, and then go forward to the wall and repeat that. And so the hardest part of this is to find the direction of turn. The rest of it, like going forward without turning or going forward straight, has mostly been discussed by everyone else. So I'm gonna step through finding its um, correct direction in detail. So first we spin 360 and cr collect a bunch of values. Initially it was collecting seven, but that didn't work out because there's occasionally bad values like Twitter or discussed earlier. And so instead I collect between one and 200 values. And that mostly works. And uh, then we remove potentially erroneous values, uh, like reflections and whatnot. Initially, this was programmed in a maze that was made out of textbooks, and that was more of an issue. Uh, then we smooth the values like Twitter did. And then we pick the, one of the potential paths, or we find all the potential paths. Because we spent 360, there's also the backwards path. So then we have to choose the correct one and make sure we don't go back unless we're in a corner or something. So I'm going to step through these, um, all these steps it goes through with an example run. And so this is the position the maze that the robot is in when it does the scan. It prints its values, the distance values, onto the screen. <coughs> so you can see here that there's two paths that can go. It can go backwards or it can go basically 45 degrees to the right. And so these two are the two potential paths that it can go down. Uh, so it's collected 186 different samples. Uh, then we remove the bad ones. The values are 255 if there's just one of them. If there's more than that, then it presumes that it probably is that far. Then it smooths it. Uh, the main reason that it has to smooth it is because if there's a value that's too little, um, too, too short with, it, with under, I think it's um, 30 or something centimeters, then it will split one path into two paths and aim itself at the wall. Uh, so. We smooth it basically by taking a weighted average of the surrounding values and replacing each value with that. I've tried three different ways of doing it, and they all work, but this was the coolest. Uh, so then we isolate different paths. And basically, it groups together all the values that are above some certain limit and considers those to be a path. So it's found two of them, and then it has to choose from among those. It chooses the path that's um, closest to the forward facing direction that's above some certain threshold. And this is how it marks this chosen path. Uh, to determine which actual direction we're going to pick, which area inside the path we're going to turn to, we determine, we calculate the um, centroid of the path. And um, doing this instead of just taking the midpoint, it allows us to, um, it allows us to take into account the fact that not all of the distance, not all the area of the path is uh, evenly distributed. As in the example you can see, there's a really short area and then there's the long area. So this is still mostly part of the wall, and this is where we want to go. So we can turn closer to the direction we actually want to go by taking that into account. And you can see the difference down here. And that was the first one. The second one I did, the second way of programming it, takes into account certain geometries of the maze to navigate it faster. 
it presumes such things as having what right degree angles. This is not the code. This one, the first one. This is, it. This is much simpler. So we go forward to the wall. It's less complicated, I should say. We go forward to the wall. We look left and right, and then turn into the direction with the longest distance, and repeat that throughout the maze. And uh, I had a video illustrates that nicely. So it goes forward. It looks left. Looks right and then turns the right direction, which is the farthest, and repeats that. One of the things we think we encountered when programming these bots is that even though you had a perfectly clean program, and you asked it to go to stay with the, within 20 centimeters of a wall, you will not always do that because the ultrasound sensor, especially, have a lot of errors. Sometimes they, they like to notice it, they read the echo, and sometimes they, they overestimate or underestimate, and they just cannot read corners. So you make a program that relies on corners, it, it's not going to work. So we had to do a lot of um, a lot of tweaking. So we will have to increase the value from 20 to 25 if you wanted it to go 20. Um, and various other tricks that we did for, for the program. So even though we had a perfect program, we had to make one that is compensated, compensated for the problems of the sensors. Um, well, after um, these four weeks of, of coming here almost every day from sunrise to sun, sundown, um, we had to have learned something. And see, these are some of the things we learned. Uh, the first thing we learned, of course, was the Lab View program. What's really cool about it is that it's not like what we're used to, or what I'm used to, which is just programming on the screen. But this is a, a, new, a new way to program. Um, I like both ways, but this is a, an interesting way. Another, another thing we learned was the, the interface with the NXTs. Um, I used to play with Mindstorms all the time, and and learning that there was more to them than what I thought was really interesting, and I bet some of the guys did too. Another thing was the AI programming, the decision making, the state machines, the differentials, the things that made the maze algorithms possible. Those are the kind of things that we were exposed to this past month. Um, we also got a feel for the research experience. This is the first um, internship that I was invited to do, so it was a real honor to be here and to get a feel of what it is to wake up you know, at 7 in the morning every day, come here, work, and go home tired and think to yourself, okay, I gotta do it tomorrow. So it's like a real job having a <laughs> And it's, it's really fun, it's really fun coming and playing. And in, in, in uh, another respect, it gets us a little more serious about is this something we wanna do, like research. Um, a lot of people, a lot of laboratories, um, invite people, come, you know, do research with us, do this, do that. And through this experience, we were able to, to see if that's something we, we enjoy doing. And finally, I'm going to leave it. Uh, so, as any good research project uh, has the goal of answering the questions that we started with, uh, I believe if it's a good research project, it should also raise some questions in the end, so we have uh, further ideas to explore. Uh, and me as a co-founder of the Skynet Robotics Club here on campus. Uh, we have a couple of ideas for, uh, I mean, I'm particularly very excited about it. Uh, once the semester starts, we can start working on these. Uh, first of all, uh, Joy and I actually played around a little bit and we made that uh, joystick that actually can detect uh, four ways of movement. And uh, I actually left it there and then Joe programmed uh, a Pictionary on one of the bricks that you can play. And I think he made a new program with uh, there were, I think he said there's some uh, squares going around the screen and you were another square supposed to avoid them. That was pretty fun. Uh, another thing is that these bricks have Bluetooth compatibility so we can actually interconnect between two of them. So remotely you can connect one to go through the maze and cheat and do it faster than everybody else. <laughs> uh, the other idea is um, Mike's uh, robot, the way the bricks slid out, it, like I said, it looks exactly like a server wrap. So I was thinking, what would it be, because we have four bricks that stay uh, with uh, us here at NASA. I was thinking, what if we actually have four of them connected together? 
And I said, you know, that's a fun idea what we'll then accomplish. And then I realized that we don't have the limitation of four sensors and uh, three motors. We can have up to 12 <laughs> motors and up to 16 sensors, which uh, I found very cool because it can give you a lot of it can give you a lot of ideas. Uh, if you can do even more complicated state machine, uh, it can take even more so you can have more obstacles because, uh, for example, if you, look, if you look at a leg, you need at least uh, two or three joints. Uh, so you can do a leg instead of uh, you can do a leg instead of wheels. So that's one of the potential. <laughs> 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 you know, basically anything with legs instead of wheels uh, would do, and. Uh, well, that's it. At the end, uh, all of us get out. So, that's all we got. It's the conclusion of our presentation. Uh, but before that, I'd like to give some special thanks to Carl Former, uh, Nick Westberg, and Alex Sim. They really helped us a lot through this project, and we really appreciate their uh, their support and their encouragement and their hard work that they uh, provided you know, for us to succeed. Uh, we want to thank the NASA Curriculum Improvements Partnership Award for the Integration of Research, uh, CI Pair. Uh, finally, want to recognize College of the Desert, Mesa, and Cal State San Bernardino. Oh, that's all. Uh, yeah. Does anybody have any questions? I have a comment, not a question. <laughs> I couldn't help but do, uh, while you're listening, uh, talking about your robots, which actually should should thought of as being a child. Uh, the, the things that you learn, the, thing, the, the obstacles, the challenges that you run, it basically is what we're required when we cross an intersection. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you want to take into account, uh, you know, like things that are coming at you, like objects. So you want to use like your sensories for, for us, you know, we have the vision and things like that. And that sort of gets mimicked with the ultrasonic sensor. Of course, it's not as fine as it, like it's, it's very limited. But you sort of get the idea of like, you know, you, you kind of like can, can be aware of a, an object in front of you. And so you compensate for that because you don't want to crash into it. Yes? Would you anticipate being able to, to use some of the uh, censoring and, and motor uh, programming that someone could use for, say, a disability? Uh, so if someone had limited eyesight, could they use uh, some something obviously much higher up, but you know, an extrapolation of some of the things you've done uh, to possibly be assistance to someone in that situation. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, came that one of the, yeah. the, the groups did was that they made sounds whenever the, the, the bot was approaching something or changed state. So maybe that's one of the things that could be incorporated where it's an ultrasonic sensor that makes sounds when something's coming from. So, oh, okay, because I can hear. Die. <laughs> I, I just had a question about the capability of the ultrasound sensors. It, it, it has it has it has two two in both of the, both of the both sides in uh, send out and receive right. Uh, one side. No, one one is a microphone. The other one is a speaker. Oh, and okay. That's how it works. So do one can't do parallax or anything. Oh no, no. Okay, all right. <laughs> what do you guys think about the rover we have in Mars? I think we want one. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, the rover already got some uh, programming now. Uh, oh, yeah, the rover is a very good example because uh, I don't know if you're familiar uh, with the details, but when Mars and uh, Mars and Earth are closest, they're still seven minutes apart for the signal to go back and forth. So, if you want to do remote control, it's absolutely out of the question that you can do anything with that kind of delay. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want to have a robot that does everything automatically because a small uh, bug you can just run into something. So what they're doing is they look at a 360 view and they tell the robot, go to that point. That's the remote control of it. Then the robot is actually traversing the terrain, observing, making decisions. Should I go over that rock or is it too big? Should I go around it? Uh, things like that. That's... Uh, you know, very, very low level of uh, what's happening. But yeah, you said it's a seven second delay. 17, seven, seven seven minutes, seven minutes, sorry. Seven minutes. Yes. The signal going, same same strength than coming back? Uh, strength doesn't, uh, doesn't matter. It's a, it always travels at the speed of light because it's uh, light even though it's in the radio frequency. Uh, yeah, it takes seven minutes, so if you want to flash a light, you say, turn it on, 
take seven minutes to go back, take seven minutes to tell you light is on, which because it's good to have a feedback. And then when you turn it off again, it's, it's, let's say that immediately, you have 14 minutes to flash light on and off. And as I said, it, for practical purposes, it's impossible. So they need to have some sort of artificial intelligence and a state machine that will make these decisions with better precision, of course. Thank you. Is that seven minutes now? I mean, because we're very close. When they're close, they're close. Yeah. <laughs> now it's like uh, you just. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Um, let's give our both groups another round.